Good afternoon, everyone. Bishop Monfort and Father Provincial, Father Sean, my fellow graduates, <laughs> brothers and sisters in the Lord. Today is Friday the 13th. <laughs> Some people think that that is an unlucky day. But for me, it's the luckiest day in my life because I'm graduating from Steubenville Franciscan <laughs> University. So, when John Paul II, I believe it was, who was beatifying the children at Fatima, the Portuguese cardinal, Cardinal uh, Martins, talked about the two children, and he commented on the fact that in today's world, so many young people in Europe and North America will spend 20 years in school and not know what these children at Fatima knew. Their illiterate parents taught them how to love God, how to pray, how to work hard, how to be part of a family, and prepared them for life and for eternal life. All of you have received that same great gift in your life as disciples and in your life here at Steubenville. We're all grateful to great friars like Father Michael Scanlon and Father Terry and now Father Sean and all of those who have worked so hard to make this college a center of spirituality, <coughs> catechesis, vocations, evangelization, community. A truly passionately Catholic university. We are so proud of everything that takes place here. Everywhere you go in the country, you meet graduates who are running RCIA programs, teaching in Catholic high schools, are working in Catholic parishes, running programs of evangelization. It is just such a blessing. And so I say Friday the 13th is the luckiest day of my life. Besides the fact that I don't have any student loans, and I, did, <laughs> and I didn't have to write any papers. Once I was at the North American College in Rome, and the seminarians were just coming out of an auditorium where, during their recreation, they had been watching one of those mindless action films, you know, with many car chases, explosions, and scores of people getting shot. Now, there was an old bishop there with them, and I heard one of the seminarians say, Your Excellency, did you enjoy the film? And the old bishop said, Too much dialogue. Well, today's gospel is what I call the last breakfast. But the purpose of this encounter was not the oatmeal or the Cheerios, but rather the dialogue. For in this post-resurrectional apparition, the risen Lord presents Peter with his final exam question. To be the vicar of Christ on earth, Peter has to answer three questions in the gospel, and he answers them all correctly. St. Peter could have gotten that honorary degree from Franciscan University, by the way. The three questions are put to St. Peter in three different venues. The first is at Caesarea Philippi, the second at the synagogue in Capernaum, and the last question, which appears in today's gospel, takes place on the shores of the Sea of Galilee. In the ruins of 
Caesarea Philippi, you can see the temples and the grandeur that must have been just stunning in Jesus' day when he went there on this visit with his apostles. There are many, many temples to the Syrian god Baal and to the Greek god Pan. Ironically enough, Pan was the pagan god of shepherds and flocks. But Jesus is the good shepherd, the real God. It's a place filled with water. In fact, it's the source of the Jordan River. Herod Agrippa built his summer home there and named it in honor of Nero, the one who later murders St. Peter on the Vatican Hill in Rome. There in the presence of this splendid pantheon of pagan divinities, Jesus asked the first question, who do you say that I am? Peter makes his stunning profession of faith. Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus says to Peter, and thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church. For the first exam question, Peter gets A+. Plus. The second question is posed in Capernaum, in the beautiful synagogue, built with the help of that centurion who gave us the words that we say each day before receiving Holy Communion. Lord, I am not worthy that you should come under my roof. You can still see the magnificent columns in that synagogue. And just down the street from that synagogue are the remains of what was St. Peter's home. It was the original Domus Santa Marta. It certainly wasn't the apostolic palace. It's more like the guest house where Pope Francis has chosen to live. Because Peter's house was like a hotel. People were coming and going all the time. Jesus and his apostles spent a lot of time there. It was practically Jesus' headquarters. And there they enjoyed many home-cooked meals by Peter's mother-in-law. You can still go there and celebrate Mass above Peter's home. What I like about that, it's the same vantage point as you're looking down in those rooms where Jesus met with the people and taught. It's the same vantage point of those four men who took their paralytic friend up to the roof and opened up the hole so that they could lower Jesus down. When I was a kid and I would hear that gospel, I used to say, gee, I'd like to have friends like that. And I'd like to be a friend like that. The crowd is always there pushing people away from the Lord, but the community is what draws people close to Jesus. And that's what our faith is about, turning the crowd into a community. The early Christians made a house church out of Peter's residence. And even today, as I said, Mass is celebrated to there. And just a few yards away is the local parish church, synagogue, where Jesus gave one of his most important sermons. The Discourse on the Eucharist, where Jesus declares, I am the bread of life, the new manna. Amen, amen, I say to you, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you will not have life within you. Many people were shocked by Jesus' words. John's Gospel says, as a result of this, many of his disciples returned to their former way of life and no longer accompanied him. They left in great numbers. But Jesus didn't call them back saying, oh, I was just kidding. It's only a metaphor. Please come back. No. Jesus did not apologize for his words, but rather he turns to his apostles and poses the second exam question. 
are you going to leave me too? Peter pushes the buzzer first and answers, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. Peter does not understand. He could not spell transubstantiation, <laughs> but he trusts in Jesus. Peter places all his hope in Jesus' words and Jesus' promises. Peter is a man of hope. The second exam question, A+. Plus. The third question takes place at what I like to call the last breakfast. We all know about the Last Supper on Holy Thursday, but today's gospel describes the risen Lord's apparition in which he prepares breakfast for a group of his apostles. It's the only time in the Gospels that we see Jesus' culinary skills. <laughs> now, the Blessed Mother probably taught him a few recipes. Jesus appears on the shore, and he calls out to his apostles, Children, have you caught anything to eat? Jesus knew that they hadn't. They were all lousy fishermen. They never caught anything unless Jesus was right there and told them, throw the net here, now. <laughs> so Jesus said, cast your net on the starboard side and you will find something. And Peter said, Lord, which is the starboard side? <laughs> Finally, after the miraculous draft of fishes and the full country breakfast comes the dialogue. The third and the final question. It's the most important question, and Peter gets three chances to answer, as if to erase the three times that he had denied Jesus. Peter, I'm sure, was embarrassed, nervous, even ashamed of what he had done. When Judas and the apostles came to arrest Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. Peter was there full of bluster and bravura. He takes out his machete and whacks off the ear of some poor servant. He wasn't even a good aim. But just then, as Peter had tried to walk on the water, his courage was short-lived. He looked at the angry expressions on the faces of those soldiers, and he runs into the darkness to escape. Then Peter tries to follow Jesus at a safe distance, as all of us do sometimes in our lives. But Peter discovers that following Jesus at a safe distance is not possible. The only way to follow Jesus is up close following Jesus carrying the cross. When Peter gets to the courtyard of the high priest and is warming himself by the fire, trying to look inconspicuous, he's recognized. His accent gives him away. It's like being from Boston. <laughs> as soon as you hear a priest say, the gospel according to Mark, <laughs> and lift up your hats, there's no doubt it's a Bostonian. So this Galilean fisherman, who can't disguise his accent, ends up denying Jesus three times, and not to a soldier with a long knife, but to a waitress with an attitude. <laughs> so Jesus says to Peter, do you love me? And Peter, filled with compunction, says, Lord, you know all things. No need of a polygraph here. You know that I love you. Jesus says, feed my sheep. For to love Jesus is to love the church. To love the good shepherd is to love the flock. Graduates, in your life of discipleship, Jesus is asking you the same questions. It's all right to cheat. You can copy the answers from St. Peter. 
These are the questions. Who do you say that I am? Do you want to leave me like so many others do? Do you love me? The correct answers need to be on your, in your hearts as well as on your lips. Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. Lord, Thou knowest all things. Thou knowest that I love Thee. In other words, we must say, Jesus, I believe in You. Jesus, I trust in Your promises. Jesus, I love You. Faith, hope, love. Here at Franciscan University, you've had such an extraordinary opportunity to deepen your life of faith, hope, and love. We are sending you forth during this jubilee year. Follow Jesus. Only He can fill your nets. Continue His message. Be the joyful and courageous messengers of the good news. The world is waiting. There is so much at stake. God bless you. Congratulations.